Hey guys, I'm Dave and welcome to the Troll Gallery. Today we're going to start a large built-in bookcase. This is a pretty big build. It's about 8 feet wide and almost 9 feet tall. And all the parts won't fit in my shop at one time. So not only are I breaking down the build, but I thought I'd break down the videos. In today's video, we're going to focus on the base cabinet. And in the next few videos, we'll do some of the detail work, the upper cabinets, and if all goes to plan, the installation as well. So let's jump in and see how this one comes together. I started this project by prepping the sub base from some scrap pieces of 3 quarter inch plywood. I ripped down enough strips to 4 inches at the table saw. I set a stop on my miter saw to cut the four long pieces of the sub base. You might notice that I make a shallow pull cut and then finish with a through push cut. This just gets me a cleaner cut on both faces. Rather than trust my math, I clamp together two of the outer pieces and the half inch ply I'll use as the outer cover of the toe kick later. Now I can set a short piece in place and mark it at the full width of my sub base or nine inches from front to back. This mark will give me an accurate cut length. I reset the stop of the miter saw and then cut enough cross pieces. After clamping the four long pieces of the base together, I transferred my layout lines. The locations for the cross pieces were left on the edge, and the center lines were transferred to one face, and I'll use these as guides for fasteners later. I started the assembly with a bit of glue on one of the short pieces, then I balanced one of the long sides so that it was flush with the edge and the sides. Then I tacked it in place with a couple of 18 gauge brads. You'll notice I move my fingers away before I pull the trigger. Pneumatic fasteners don't always go in straight and I'd rather not risk my fingers for a project. The opposite short piece was attached in the same way. Then the center piece. And finally the last two dividers. Now I probably didn't need this many cross braces across four feet, but I had the stock and I'd rather be safe than sorry. I flipped the assembly over, applied glue to all the short sections, and then one at a time I lined them up and tacked them in place. I checked the inner pieces for square as I went. Once everything was connected, I checked the full unit for square and it was dead on. And then I repeated these steps for the other sub base. The glue and brads would probably be strong enough, but I pre drilled each connection with a countersink bit, then came back with some inch and a half screws and locked everything in place. I gave them a quick sanding and set them aside for now. To start on the cabinets themselves, I had to break down some 3 quarter inch plywood. Since I don't have a track saw, Yet, I used my shop made jig and circular saw. The first two cuts would provide the materials for the cabinet sides and I cut them a bit longer than necessary for now. With the panels a bit more manageable, I could move to the table saw to complete the cuts. First I ripped the panels in half, reset the fence and with the factory edge away from that fence I cut the sides to their final width. Back of the miter saw, I squared one end of each side panel, then added a pencil mark on the other end so I'd know which to cut next. One more stop block, and then the panels were cross cut to their final length. I prepared the three bottom panels while I was working on the sides since they're the same width. I adjusted the stop block and cut them to their length as well. The back and top stretchers are the same size as the bottom, so I cut them while the stop was still in place. Cutting two at once just saves a bit of time. The sides and bottom need a rabbit to accept the back. Rather than mess around with my dado set, I just made a pass on the table saw, adjusted the fence and made a second pass. It was just deep enough to accept the quarter inch plywood I'll use for those backs. I got out my vintage Craig 2000 pocket hole jig and drilled two holes on the underside of both ends of the bottom pieces. Their locations aren't critical, but I still made tick marks so they'd be even. I'm just twitchy that way. Then I drilled three holes in the outside of the front edge of the four side pieces. 
These will be used to connect the face frame to the cabinets later. The rear and top stretchers each got two holes on either end. The stock is thinner, so I changed the setup of my jig for half inch stock. After giving all the parts a good sanding with 150 grit on my random over sander, it was time for assembly. I started with this jig to ensure that the bottom sat at the correct locations on the sides. The cleat is set flush to the top of the side and clamped in place. A bead of glue is spread out on the side. Then the bottom is set in place making sure that the front edges are flush. And the two inch and a quarter pocket hole screws lock everything in place. That jig just prevents the bottom from sliding up while the screws are being driven in. Then I flip the unit around. The jig was set on the other side and it's glued and screwed like the first. A clamping square helped hold things in place while I worked. Next the back stretcher is glued and screwed in place. The top edge is flush with the top of the sides and the outer edge is flush with the rabbet for the back. A clamp helps hold everything in place while I fuss around and get everything just so before driving in those screws. One more flip of the box and the front stretcher goes in. The connection is similar to the rear stretchers but this time it's set flush to the front and the top and turned 90 degrees. The basic box is now completed. I'd like you to think that I have a plan in mind before I begin building. Well, the truth is I start with a sketch and kind of build as I go. If I actually planned this out, I probably would have set the bottoms and dados, but I didn't. So plan B is adding a few cleats to support the bottom. These will all be hidden by the face frame. They were set flush to the front edge, a bit of glue on one side and one edge, and the cleats are fastened in with a couple of screws. I used inch and a quarter pocket hole screws, well, because they were handy. I put one of these cleats on either side, and then just glued and clamped a third cleat in the center. You know, just in case. To begin the face frames, I ripped down several pieces of four quarter poplar just over two inches wide at the table saw. I ganged up all the strips and gave them a few passes through the planer. This not only cleans up the saw marks, but brings them to their final width. The two inner rails were cut to length at the miter saw. Then I could clamp them in place to determine the length of the long styles and the two outer rails. While everything was in place, I took the time to mark the location of the inner styles on those rails. Clamping the two rails together, I could transfer those marks across both pieces. A marking stick, the length of my door openings, was helpful in locating the exact location of the outer styles. And this also gave me the cut mark for the rail length. With the rails still clamped together, I took them back to the miter saw and snuck up on that first cut line. Then I flipped them around and cut them to their final length. After resetting my pocket hole jig for 3 quarter inch stock, I used it to drill two holes on either end of the inner styles. The rails got the same holes, I just had to relocate to the shop floor since these guys are nearly 8 feet long. I also took the time to sand the edges of all my stock, because that's never easy after everything's assembled. To assemble the face frames, I used some clamps to hold things in place, and my spacer to ensure the correct location for the styles. Then a bit of glue, a face frame clamp, although I think Craig now calls this a wood project clamp and some inch and a quarter fine pocket hole screws to lock everything together. I connected both inner styles to one rail, added more glue and screwed them to the second rail, and then added the outer rails making sure that their edges sat flush to the outer edge of the styles. A quick check of the diagonals to make sure that the frame was square and I'm always surprised when it hits dead on. Once the glue dried and the interface was sanded, it was time to clamp the face frame back in place. Since the face frame is going to be added during the installation, I wanted some positive registration points. I marked several locations along the top and bottom of the frame and the cabinet, and I'll use those to locate some biscuits. I set my biscuit joiner so the slot would be centered on the half inch thick upper stretchers, and I could cut my slots on the rail. 
and then the mating locations on the face frame. I reset the slot height for the 3 quarter inch bottoms and cut those slots as well. First in the face frame, and then in the bottom itself. Biscuits allow for a little side to side play, which normally isn't an issue. But again, I wanted a positive registration point. So I marked the rail and the bottom of the center cabinet, and then at the drill press, drilled a 3 8 inch hole about a half an inch deep into the face frame. The mating hole was drilled with a drill guide to keep it square. I made sure that it was deep enough to accept the dowel that I'd use as my guide pin. The right side of the cabinet will be exposed, so I decided to add a false end piece. Again, I grabbed some half inch birch ply and cut it to width at the table saw, and then it was back to the miter saw to cut it to length. This may seem odd, but I decided to miter the toe kick to the false end piece. The first step was to miter the toe kick at the chop saw, and I made sure to clamp it in place so I'd get a nice clean cut. After cutting the notch for the toe kick from the side, I clamped a straight piece of stock to the edge. That allowed me to use a chamfer bit in my router, letting me get the angle all the way to the tip of the face. I snuck up on my cut in a few passes until that miter was right at the edge of the side. Then I could mill two filler strips to push out that false side to the correct location. I used double stick tape to secure them to the side so that I could locate all the mounting points in just the right spots. I clamped the false side to the right side of the cabinet and after determining where the hinges would mount later, I located the mounting points. I drilled through those points with a small drill bit just so I could locate them on both the cabinet and that false side. I used those same locations to connect all the cabinets together and drill those marking points while I was at it. I not only marked which piece went where, but I also marked some fastener holes. I'll use these to fasten the fillers to the sides. I made sure to set my depth stop so it would not penetrate through the show face or that side piece. After removing the fillers from the sides, I switched over to a brad point bit that was just large enough for the barrel of my panel connectors. Then I drilled through holes for them. And I'm not sure if you can see this or not, but I made sure to circle which hole I was supposed to drill at this point. You know, again, just in case. The barrel of my connectors were just a bit too long for my fillers. I used my calipers to determine how deep I'd need to drill to hide the head in the next step. I wanted the edge of the barrel to sit just shy of the filler's face. Switching to a larger brad point bit and checking the depth on some scrap stock, I can now drill spaces into the sides to hide the head of those barrels. T-nuts may have been easier, but I didn't have any this small. These connectors are usually fastened with a pair of Allen wrenches, but that won't work here. So I mixed up some 5 minute epoxy and glued the barrels in place. I made sure that they sat just below the face and that there wasn't too much squeeze out that would prevent the fillers from sitting flush to the sides in the next step. Then I set it aside to dry overnight because five minute epoxy never is. The next morning I came back and added a bead of glue and three short screws to connect the spacers to the side. Again I set that aside to dry before checking the fit. The backs were cut from quarter inch birch ply just like the other parts. First they were cut down with my Craig rip cut then cut to width with my shop made jig and then they got a quick sanding with 150 grit paper and set aside for now. I wasn't sure if I wanted to drill the holes for the cabinet connectors now or wait until after paint but I decided now would be good. I'll probably need to clean them out later but that'll only take a minute. The key here is to drill from the inside out and back that outer side. I still might get some blowout, but the outside of the cabinets will never be seen. That blue tape on my bit, that's just there to let me know that I've gone deep enough to penetrate the sides. Shifting gears, I moved over to the top of the base cabinets. The inch and a half thick poplar I picked up was pretty flat, but not real straight. Since I don't have a jointer, yet, I clamped on a long piece of quarter inch aluminum as a straight edge. Using my palm router and a short template bit, I cut a straight edge on both pieces I'd need for my top. Then I switched over to a larger router 
and a flush trim bit and cleaned up the rest of that first edge. Back at the table saw, the opposite edge was trimmed square and parallel to the first edge. I ended up being a bit short of my desired width, so I added a strip of four quarter poplar ripped to the same thickness as the top to fill it out. I used pipe clamps to glue the top together. Not that I needed lots of clamping pressure, but most of my smaller clamps were holding the case together. That, with pieces this heavy, I always feel more secure with a heavier clamp. I laid down a bead of glue, spread it out, and clamped the top together. Before calling it a day, I wiped off the excess glue so I'd have a smooth face when I came back later. And since this is being painted and poplar is a closed grain wood, I wasn't too worried about smearing the glue into the pores. The next day, a few passes through the planer cleaned up both faces. And yes, this is getting heavy. So much for resting my arm. Then it was over to the miter saw to square one end. The top was just a bit too wide for a full cut, so I trimmed that last little bit with a pull saw. Then I could flip the top around and cut it to length. After a bit of sanding, it was time to ease the edges. I chucked up an eighth inch roundover bit and ran it along the front and right side of the top. Then flipped it over and repeated for the underside as well. I clamped the top on edge so I could hit that right front corner too. I didn't want any sharp edges since my clients have little kids. I gave all the parts one more sanding at 150 grit with my random orbit sander and it was time to start painting. I used an HVLP spray gun and gave all the show sides a coat of primer. Once that had dried, I sanded everything with 220 grit paper to reduce any fuzz that was raised, and then I came back with two coats of paint. The guys at Tanner Paint, a Benjamin Moore dealer here in Tampa, turned me on to Scuff-X a while back, and he used it on most of my paint grade work it sprays well and resists scuffing very well. And that's key if there are kids or pets around. This build isn't that difficult. It's just as a lot to it. And because I work alone, I have to keep things light enough that I can install it myself. And while I would prefer to have it in as few pieces as possible, I did promise my doctor that I'd rest my arm and my wrist and my shoulder. That's why this piece is in seven sections instead of one. In the next few videos, we'll finish up the bottom cabinets, build the uppers, and if all goes well, bring you along for the installation. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this video. Was there something I could have done differently, smarter, easier? Drop them in the comments below. I'd love to hear. If you enjoyed this video, maybe give us a thumbs up and share it with your friends. And if you haven't already, maybe it's time to hit that subscribe button and the little bell so you get notified I put out a new video. Well, I'm pretty sure I know what's coming up next. You never know. I might slide in something quick and easy in between. So until then, have a great day. Stay safe and take care. We'll see you soon.